Hello everyone, I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library and I'm here with Jenny Stapp, your state librarian, and it's time for our almost monthly website chat. So we also have Matt Beckstrom here today. He is with the Lewis and Clark Library, but he's also our representative to the American Library Association from the Montana Library Association. And Matt comes and joins Jenny kind of regularly. I just want to point out that we do record all of these website chats, and I keep the most recent ones up and available in, an, well, it's kind of an album. Now Vimeo is calling these showcases. Uh, but anyway, you can you can view these, and I do make an effort to make sure that they get posted within a couple of hours of the recording. So if you ever have to miss a website chat, you know you can catch up pretty quickly. And if you ever need that link, just shoot me an email, and I'm happy to send you the direct link to that showcase. And I do want to bring you up to date just on a couple of training activities still planned. Uh, from your state library, we have a couple of Census 2020 in the library trainings planned, one next week that Tracy St uh, Cook's going to do at the Stone Child College in Box Elder, and then I'm going to be in at Belgrade Community Library on October 17th. That's at 9 in the morning. I think Ch Tracy's is in the afternoon, 2.30, I think. These are um, trainings take about, about an hour, hour and a half. It's just a really kind of a overview of what libraries can expect with the census 2020 next spring and some ideas about how to get prepared and to work with your community members for getting a complete count in Montana. Um, there's been some changes to the census and so we're trying to get the word out on that. We have a lot of materials that we've developed. We've got some bookmarks, some posters we're starting to distribute to libraries that they can put up to just kind of let their patrons know that, you know, the library is a place you can come if you don't have access to the internet at home and want to complete your census forms online. And then we are putting together a toolkit that we'll have available at the end of this month that um, it's kind of a reference source for libraries about the census and we've made it very Montana specific. And let's see, we have uh, the pre-conference and the Ripple conference coming up at the Billings Public Library early next month and that is almost sold out. We had a couple of cancellations so I think there's one or two seats left. It's free to attend, it's two full days and, and it's those are really full busy days and it's really an introduction to uh, be, become making your library a little more uh, data decision focused so um, how to collect data how to use it how to um, how to access data and uh, for making informed decisions at your library um, both Jenny and Tracy and I, I received a some a, a smaller version of this training so we're just really enthusiastic about it and happy to have the Colorado State Library here in Montana to provide this to you. So kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to get that training so close for free. So if, if you do have time, you might want to snag one of those last seats. And then the State Library is going to do an orientation on October 25th. That is um, a uh, getting to know you orientation at the State Library. We've done these in the summer last year. It was pretty popular. Um, this is for new-ish librarians to come and kind of find out what the State Library does and how we're organized. So we invite you into Helena for a day. It's a kind of starts later in the day, finishes early in the day so you have some drive time and just get to kind of know our whole staff and, and how we operate. And then I do want you to put aside the these dates in um, June next year at the for the Public Library Directors Institute. We haven't got the program all together yet. I'm right now in the process of uh, uh, hiring a facilitator, but we do have the dates set aside more or less June 8th to the 11th. I'm not sure we're going to go all the way to the 11th, but but just put those dates aside. These are going to be public library directors only. It will be free to attend, and that'll include your your room and board at uh, the Ursuline Center in Great Falls. So that's what's coming up in training that I have to report today. And I'm going to turn things over to you, Jenny. Thanks, Joe, and thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, I'm going to put in 
one more plug for the Ripple conference that Joe previously mentioned that there's a couple seats available. Um, some of you have heard me say this before. It was really attending the first Ripple conference in Colorado Springs a few years ago that put the State Library on the path to be very focused on a data-driven culture, a way of evaluating our programs and services using uh, better data to help us understand the impact of the work that we do. And so, as Joe said, this is really a wonderful opportunity that we're bringing to Montana to help grow that culture across the state. It's something that we believe in. We think it's very, very important, not only to improve the services from our libraries, but also to help us better advocate for the work that we do. Uh, I'm really excited to have the folks from the Colorado State Library. I also want to mention the pre-conference on Sunday afternoon. Annie Norman, the state librarian from the state of Delaware, is going to be leading that session. Um, they have a great data-driven culture in the state of Delaware, and I'm really excited for us to learn more about how they apply a data-driven model to the work that they do and, and to learn more about how we can apply some of that learning here in Montana. So uh, I really encourage you, if you have any interest at all, to take advantage of one of those couple of remaining seats. Um, I have just a few updates from the State Library before I turn things over to Matt. Uh, first, I want to mention that the next commission meeting is not on the typical second Wednesday of October. We've actually rescheduled it to Friday, October 4th because of the Ripple conferences. We didn't want to uh, overlap with the Ripple Conference or come into conflict with people having to come and grow from those events. So the next commission meeting is going to be Friday, October 4th, and it's going to be at the White Sulphur Springs Library, the Mar County Public Library, which is a brand new library. It just opened in June, and we're really excited to be able to uh, have a meeting in their new building and, and help them celebrate the, the launch of that new building. Uh, we're going to be having a meeting of the Federation coordinators at the library there on Thursday, October 3rd in the afternoon. There's going to be a public reception on Thursday night at the library and then the commission meeting beginning at 9.30 on Friday morning. Um, so if you're in the area, I encourage you to tune in. We will try to have that meeting available online as well. Um, and Specifically at this commission meeting, um, this is the meeting where we sort of wrap up our work planning for the upcoming fiscal year. So we'll be reviewing the work plan priorities from the State Library with the commission. Uh, that includes things like the census work that Joe has already talked about. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the work priorities from the State Library. All of that information will be made available online here in the next couple of days, and then uh, we'll be discussing it in more detail with the Commission on October 4th. Uh, I want to put in a little plug for the next website chat on October 11th. We've been doing some reorganization here at the State Library, and I plan to, at that October 11th website chat, um, go into greater detail about some of the organizational changes that we're making. We have a draft org chart that the Commission is going to be reviewing at their October 4th meeting that we'll be making more publicly available after that. Uh, so I want to have a chance to review the new organizational structure with all of you and talk about what some of those organizational changes mean. One of the things you'll note when you look at the agency work plan is that for the first time ever we have a single agency work plan that represents the work priorities across the agency and I think that's important for all of you because we're really trying hard to make sure that the various services and operations of the State Library that we operate uh, are operated in ways that benefit all of our partners and stakeholders, including the library community. 
there's a lot that goes on at the State Library that you might not have much familiarity with, like our Geographic Information Systems Program, our Natural Heritage Program, and so forth. And so, again, for the first time, the priorities of those programs are reflected in a single agency work plan with the intent of providing opportunities for better integration and coordination amongst our staff so that we can, in turn, better support all of you. So I want to spend some time reviewing that information uh, at the October 11th website chat. And, and again, that information will be made available online through commission materials prior to that. I'm going to stop and ask if there's any questions. Two other quick updates that I wanted to share. Um, I have reviewed this week all of the certifications that public libraries submitted for the public library standards um, and uh, am in the process of sending out notifications about the acceptance of those certifications. Um, we're issuing state aid checks here in the next couple of days. Public libraries, uh, again, will be receiving the per capita, per square mile state aid. Um, most of you will recall that that funding was suspended over the last two fiscal years following budget cuts in 2017. But that funding is once again available. Those checks will be coming out in the next few days. And I also want to mention that those state aid checks will also include Public Library Federation funds. We're administering those checks as a, as a single payment to libraries rather than two separate checks. And also related to the federation funding, the total amount awarded to federations for, through the State Library Commission has increased from 176000 to 225000 So uh, libraries will be seeing a nice increase in their amount of federation funds. If you're not sure how much your library should receive in federation funds, I would direct you to your federation's plan of service where that um, information is detailed. So again, you'll be receiving one check in the near future that is both your state aid as well as your federation funds with the increased amount based on your, your federation plan of service. And if you have any questions about any of that information, uh, be sure to follow up with me or one of your consultants. And then the last thing I wanted to mention uh, is that this week kicked off a study through the Legislative Finance Committee, a study of how to provide more diverse and more stable funding for the State Library. Uh, some of you have probably heard me talk about House Bill 633, which was passed by the 2019 legislature, which provided some one-time only monies to the State Library, and it also called for the Legislative Finance Committee to conduct an interim study about how best to fund the services of the State Library. Again, that effort kicked off with a meeting this past Wednesday. It, the, the members of the, the committee that are conducting the study are members of the Legislative Finance Committee, which include legislators who served on the Education Budget Subcommittee, who hears the State Library's budget, as well as members of the Legislature's Education Interim Committee. Um, the focus of the study is looking at the costs of the services that the State Library offers and alternative funding models for funding those services. Representative Lou Jones of Conrad, who has served for many years on the various financial committees of the legislature, including House Appropriations and Senate Finance and Claims, is very concerned that the, the primary source of funding for the State Library is the State General Fund. Um, he's concerned that um, because that's largely, largely driven by income tax, it's, um, there's potential threat to that income source especially if the country is facing a, a recession, which he believes is um, more imminent than not. Um, and then, of course, we're also funded through coal severance tax funds, and he's concerned about 
um, the future of coal production in Montana and how that might impact the availability of coal severance tax funds. So he spoke very specifically about the need to provide more diverse, he used the word dynamic funds for the state library, meaning funds that can keep up with increasing costs to provide our services. Uh, I spoke about the nature of some of the services and how our services are used, as well as some of the challenges and opportunities we see with various funding models. I, I have to say I was just really thrilled to feel like we were starting the study with a group of legislators who already value and appreciate the work of the State Library. I don't feel like we have to make a case for our services first. I think they understand uh, and, as I said, value these services already and they're sincerely committed to finding ways to fund them in the future. Uh, so at this point, our work is to identify specific costs for the various services we offer, the potential costs for services that we would like to offer in the future, and potential funding models that could provide uh, different kinds of funding sources in addition to general fund. One of the points that was made by the committee was that to the extent that our library services do benefit the general public, it makes sense that some general funds still go to support the services, but they would like to see more diverse funding that can help us manage any potential volatility in the funding in the future. So a, a really great kickoff to that work. That study will last uh, approximately the next year. The last meeting of the interim before the 2021 session will be in September of 2020. So it's by that meeting that this subcommittee would have to propose and have the Legislative Finance Committee approve any legislation that would then carry forward into the 2021 legislative session. I'm going to ask if there's any questions about the study. There's nothing in the chat box yet, but let's uh, give folks a chance to open their mics or chance to type. But I'm not seeing anything, so. All right. Well, while we're talking about sort of government affairs topics, I think I'll turn things over to Matt. Government affairs stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Joe, do you want to make me the presenter? So welcome, everyone. Thank you for um, taking your valuable lunch time to um, sit and listen to me talk. Um, you should have, have, the, have the calm, as it were. There you go. We do yeah, see your screen, can, Matt. Can you see it? OK. So um, just a bit of background for you all. This is the MLA Issues Caucus. Um, this was started last year sometime. Um, as a way for me as the as your ALA representative to kind of uh, ferry information between what's happening at the association nation, nationally, uh, bring that information back to you in Montana and also for the for the other way around for me to listen to you about issues um, we're facing as Montana's Montana libraries and if needed write up resolutions for the for the Montana Library Association and take them if possible if needed to the end, uh, back to ALA. Um, I only have a couple of things I wanna talk about today. Um, so, but this is meant to be an open discussion and forum. So I will try to remember to take breaks once in a while. Um, if anybody has anything they'd like to talk about, any other issues you'd like to bring up, any other possible resolutions, um, this is the time to do it. Um, I will write up some quick notes about this and send them out after we're done. So uh, the very first thing I think you guys can all see there was, um, at the Melee Midwinter Conference last January, the ALA Council um, took on uh, a new resolution. Um, it's on your screen now. It's a resolution in support of civil rights protections for, for people of diverse gender identities. Uh, I don't want to read all of it. It's it's you know it's a page or so long here, um, but the the idea is to um, well the resolve the resolve statements you know encourage libraries to defend civil rights protections in their policies and procedures and their actions in accordance with the ALA Code of Ethics, encourages libraries to create welcoming and inclusive spaces to meet the information needs of people, diverse gender identities, uh, reviews ALA 
a do policy documents and internal procedures to ensure equity, diversity, and inclusion principles are reflected throughout um, and broadly communicated to the membership and creates avenues within the existing ALA structures to highlight model policies as well as identify model training and educational opportunities for library staff and administrators. So I kind of paraphrase those really quick. I will send this out um, on Wired if you guys want me to. But I, I was asked if this is something that the Montana Library Association would like, would like to uh, create their own resolution um, as a support from showing Montana Library Association support for people of different diverse gender identities. Um, so I've got a, um, a, a couple people interested to work with me on this, but I kind of want to talk to you and see if there's any comments or any questions or anybody who would like to work with me on this. I'll, I'll pause for a minute. So Matt, this is Nancy with the Woodsworth Library. Hi. Um, one of the, the things that I heard from others is the concern for this, how does that affect us for like bathroom areas? And because um, some of them were concerned that, so does this mean we can't say a guy can't go into the women's area when the girls are in there type thing? Because uh, he says no, he's I, a female. I don't think it's going to be that specific. It's just going to be talking about, you know, ways that we can make sure that we're being, we're, you know, being open to all gender, gender ID, identities. And if that's something that someone can, you know, a library can do, the great, but I, I, this certainly would not be any kind of a way of, of, of um, dictating how the library should operate in that fashion. Okay. I just, I mean, having talked with several other people, that was just kind of a concern. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, that would not be, no. Okay. It's just to make sure that we're open and welcoming, you know, and, and everything we can in, in libraries. It's not a problem, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. I think I'm, I'm sorry, my mm -hmm. microphone is so out. It's a good question because, I mean, that's people do tend to immediately go to those hot button issues like um, personal privacy and bathroom use because that's something that's really tangible. Mm -hmm. So it's good to address the um, concerns that people are most are likely to have. And the next step for this is honestly that is that the, that rewriting of, you know, I was, I was hoping to have a draft today, but I didn't get started at enough time. I'd like to draft up a, a, um, a draft resolution and then send that out to membership again where we can discuss those issues in greater detail. But to get it to get the discussion started today would be good. Um, but if 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 we want to continue on with this, I've got a couple of people that that are willing to work with me on this and uh, draft up a, a draft and send it out to membership. No, I think it's a good idea. Okay. The second thing I want to talk about, um, the other thing the American Library Association is doing under James Neal, Jim Neal, the president Jim Neal, ALA a couple of years ago, ALA president a couple of years ago, he put together a working group uh, called SCOE, which stands for, oh, Organizational Effectiveness, uh, Steering Committee on Organizational Effectiveness. Whew, that's hard to remember. Um, and so his, the charge of, of, of the SCOE, as you can see on this slide here, to do a review of, of ALS governance, membership participation, and legal structures to try to make the association more efficient. Um, it, it's kind of felt like, you know, as the association has grown throughout the, the decades that we've become kind of overburdened in areas and, 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 and it, it, organizational structures become heavy in areas because it's kind of grown over years. And so the, the charge was to kind of do this, this fundamental review from the, from the ground up over the entire organization about how it's all developed and, and organized and how it, it works. And it's, it's been pretty, pretty um, interesting to read the, um, um, the the out, outcomes of some of this, this some of their research where they're finding these areas that are are, are ways for the organization that are easy easy things to change um, but they've also come up with some recommendations um, that are kind of of serious implications in the way that the organization is 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 operated 
uh, and I, I just want to preface this whole discussion with with that this is all preliminary. Nothing at this point has been voted on. Nothing at this point has been decided. This is all still preliminary by the SCOE, the steering committee um, of recommendations. They're they're recom make, making recommendations to the ALA executive board, um, to the ALA um, staff, and to the ALA council um, of what of ways they think that this can be done. So nothing that they've come up with at this point is is chiseled in stone yet. So I wanna, I wanna run through this slide, these slides really quick. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on all of them. I don't wanna do all of them, but I kinda wanna touch on a couple of things that have become um, issues with uh, some of the membership. Um, there's the timeline you can see right now. They're, they're, they're not looking at a presentation to council um, until midwinter of 2020, um, and then have the council vote an annual in 2020. Um, so this is their their product projects. The preliminary rec recommendations um, are to achieve the goals. I don't want to go through that. Um, they've kind of divided things up a little bit here. So the first thing they want to do is redesign the ALA executive board. Um, this is slightly different from the way it is right now, and in, the, in, the, in that the the way that people are um, put on the ALA executive board. So you can see they're suggesting eight member members at large, five members from the executive board. Uh, the ALA executive director and an, a, an, a, an executive committee that would made up of officers and an executive director. Um, and then the, the executive board will get input from different committees that are uh, that are contained members from the membership. So there's a nominating leadership committee, policy and development committee, finance and audit committee. No one's really having any issues with those too much. Sorry, I'm skipping through these really quickly. Then they also will be receiving, the ALA executive board will also be receiving input from three other different types of assemblies. Um, there's the planning and engagement leadership assembly, and there's also these other ones, the endowment of trustees, the accreditation commission. The one where people start to come into uh, issues is with this last one here, the um, advisory committees. So they wanna, they wanna create these three advisory committees um, where are they at? Sorry, I'm skipping ahead here a little bit. I lost the slide that has the information going. Um, I've lost the slide that has the different advisory committees. Sorry, basically the, there, there's three committees um, and one of them would, would, be, con would contain um, members from, from um, where is it at right there? I can't find it, sorry. I'm not gonna spend too much time working on it. There it is, the chapter leadership assembly. So they would have an assembly of members from different chapters and that's what Montana is. We're a chapter of the ALA um, and I'm the chapter representative to ALA on the ALA council. Um, so this would do away with council. So ALA council as it exists now would, would, would cease to exist and instead would be shifted over to this idea of a chapter leader assembly, the round table assembly and the division leadership assembly. Um, and each one of these, I can't find the slide, they're, they're smaller. I think they're you know 10 to 15 members. Um, and so that's the number one issue that's come up is, is the, 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 the removal of ALA council and instead moving into an advisory assembly to the ALA executive board. Um, and there was a document posted on ALA Connect. Let me find the... Right. An open letter to SCOE opposing the elimination of ALA Council. I can send links to these out if everyone would like to. So basically, they're saying here that the you know the SCOE has released its initial recommendations, and um, the most dramatic of these changes being proposed is the elimination of Council, ALA's legislative body. And so this this um, open letter was written by these different roundtables, and they are opposing the the removal of the of the council uh, as it is right now, and instead it, um, are asking SCOE to go back and find a different way to do this. So I kind of wanted to, to bring this out to you guys and see, because this really is my job as ALA representative is to be that that voice at ALA council speaking for Montana. Um, and not, I'm not the only one, you know, I'm the one elected by the membership, but we do have two other members in of the ALA council in Montana um, and Eubank, is a, as a member of ALA Council, as well as um, Susan Gregory from Bozeman. So those three people, those three people would would no longer have our voice in in, in general 
votes unless one of us got onto this chapter uh, leader assembly. Uh, so I'll pause really quick here and see if anyone has any initial um, content or any, any questions. Joe, uh, I guess. Well, I'm not seeing any. Oh, Let's see, there's a couple of notes in the chat box. Um, thank you for your work on this, Matt. Um, and yeah. from West Yellowstone, that the West Yellowstone Library supports the gender diversity um, uh, resolution. And Debbie says, well, well what's the purpose? What, what's the advantage of moving to a smaller group? She really asks, what is the purpose of moving to a smaller group? And I think, you know, there's been some discussion about, you know, how L L ALA Council feels very, very big and, and cumbersome and bulky. You it's know, how and, big and is it? I was wondering. I mean, it's, how it's many? It's around 100 members. It's yeah. around 100 people. Um, and, you know, and only you figure only roughly 50 or so of those are actual chapter members, you know, like like me from Montana. Um, then on top of that, you've got representatives from the different divisions. So there's a leader representative, there's a PLA representative, and those are the voice from those different areas. Uh, some of the different roundtables and other other things have have a voice in ALA Council as well. But there's also a large portion of of um, at large members that are voted by the membership as a whole. Um, so I, I think the feeling is that ALA Council has become quite large and and difficult. And in and in a way, I can see that you know being in council sessions as as we try to get things passed, it it it, it can be a very cumbersome process. To, to talk about you know policy changes or even even resolutions sometimes coming from the, di the different divisions or areas of ALA and working their way up to council and then getting to council and being and being thrown back to the division and, you know, it can be a cumbersome process um, and so I can see how that process could be refined a little bit um, but I think that the idea of SCO is eliminate council and then move to a smaller advisory board that can that can make decisions quicker and more effectively, um, and and maybe that's the solution. You know, I I don't know. I'm not. I'm certainly not going to voice. But I I can see the I can see the discussion going either way being effective. Um, but at the same time, I can also see the the lack of of input that that we are are given as chapter members um, through me or from the different divisions, which would still exist, but in this much smaller capacity. Next question looks like someone has a, Nancy has a question, who makes the change? Do we have a say in this or how would it, how this would or would not come about? Um, they are holding, um, the SCOE is holding membership meetings. I think they're having a town hall in October where any member of ALA can certainly chime in and talk about this. And I, I have a feeling that this open letter is gonna be a, a, a bullet point in that discussion. So they're, they're, they're constantly taking input right now. And I will send out some information to Wired about this. Um, to where people can go to get to put their input. Um, ultimately, the change would come down to council, um, and that that I remember discussing that at council in January about asking council to vote themselves out of existence, and that's basically what's going to happen if 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 the recommendations of SCOE uh, move forward to a full floor vote at council. That's what council would have to do is basically vote themselves out. And looking at the letter, one of the comments about only 12 of the 17 on the executive board, which would really have almost total authority now, um, mm -hmm. are elected by the general membership. Yeah. So that that seems a bit of a concern. And, and also, the, I, I have the same reaction to, I mean, when you call something an advisory committee, then, then that means that they don't. They're advisors. They're not. Yeah. They're not actually. Their yeah. their opinion and advice can be ignored. Exactly, because I mean, right now, I mean, since I'm a member of council, I have a vote, you know. And if I have a, if I have a vote that that you know that I, I think I need to come back to you guys and ask you guys about and, and how I should vote, that's what we'll do. You know, I have a say. You know, whether it's one of a hundred vote, but I have a vote. You know, if if this goes through, I become only if I'm on that committee, I just become an advisor. So we would lose our vote as chapter as chapter members unless I was elected to that to the executive board.
And I'm so speaking as a as a member of ALA right now. This is Joe, yeah. not in my capacity at the state library. But I, I'd really like to know a lot more about how that executive board is so going to be selected. Yeah, that would be very very key to you know my my interest in. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, there's 17 members, including. These following officers will be elected, president, president elect, immediate past president, and treasurer, eight at large members of the board elected by the membership, five members selected by the executive board for unique skills. Uh, ALA executive director will be ex officio and an executive committee will be made up of the officers. So that's really it. There will be only eight, um, eight members of the board elected by the membership. And, and then the president, president elect, immediate past president, and treasurer would also be elected by the membership. So the officers plus eight members and yep. five members that the executive board, that the, those, the, then those members would select five others that they said that they yeah. decided they needed. That's it. That's it. Awesome. So <laughs> okay. It's, it's, you know, and like, like the letter says, you know, this is a 58,000 member organization um, containing dozens of unique divisions, chapters, and roundtables. And, and can you fully get the 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 input that you need necessary to make decisions for the entire organization from those what thirteen people? And that's the question. So let me and I and I bring this up not only just to bring information to to you as the members. I will send some information out wired with some of this information. Um, but also, also the possibility of, you know, I don't know if this is something that we, the members of MLA or mem as MLA as a chapter, would like to say back to to ALA. If, if we if we truly oppose this change, do do we put together a, a resolution in in support of the change or in, in, in you know against the change? And obviously, my vote would be. I mean, if 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 we don't like this change, my vote would be to to vote against it or for it. And just a reminder of the timeline again, going forward with this proposal. Sure. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, they're meeting in August and September. Uh, the SCOI members are meeting in August and September, I believe. Let me go back to this. Uh, do, 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 do. Presentations to LA Executive Board. So really now is when they're looking for input. Right now. Yeah, if I remember correctly, there's a town hall in, August, in October. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it out again. I thought I, I thought it was in here. I missed it. But um, yeah, I, th I do believe there's a town hall in October. That they if will you be get that information to me. I'll make sure it gets posted onto the yeah. Aspen calendar so people can easily find it. We can. And their goal is to make the decision to the full presentation to council in midwinter of 2020, um, and then have vote one at annual. And then they, I did. They, they do. They they do require council to vote twice. So the second vote would be midwinter 2021, and that would be the one where the the recommendations would be officially. Um, push forward, and then the, in the entire vote for everything would be sent to the membership in spring of 2021. So the final say would be for the full members to make the decision. And Nancy says, I think we need to discuss this at MLA and possibly a resolution. I agree. I think uh, we obviously will discuss it at MLA, but I think a resolution, if we're going to do something about that, would have to happen in the next couple of months. Or I mean, it, it, yeah, obviously we're looking we're looking for changes b before then. But yeah, I can put together a resolution text and and um, send it out. And, and Matt, I I assume you've been discussing this with the MLA board. I haven't yet, actually. I I, I was waiting for them to put out their preliminary recommendations, which they did a while ago. Um, but I've not brought it to the MLA board at this point, so that would be the next step. I was kind of waiting for some of this information. And then the letter was just posted um, September 10th, I think. Yeah. So this open letter was just posted the 10th. 10 days ago. Yeah. Well, I think things are happening. I just haven't had a chance to get to them yet. But yeah, that's the next step is to talk to the MLA board as well. 
Okay. Well, if there's no more further discussion about this, we can move on to just open topics. If anybody has anything else that they would like to talk about, any other issues, any other resolutions, um, anything else you'd like me to know as my, my role as ALA representative? Matt, this is Jenny, and I'll just okay. share an update on the federal funding. I think okay. the, the, those on the line will remember that uh, MLA passed a resolution in support of the dollar per capita initiative that's being sponsored by the chief officers of state library agencies. That's the initiative that would increase the amount of federal library services technology act funding from the current 160 million dollar appropriation to 325 million dollars uh, the um, that effort um, is being it, uh, let's see how should i say this the american library associations ask for that funding uh, was not the full dollar per capita. Uh, it was a re, um, it was a muddled ask. Uh, the ask was not clear, um, but the ask would provide an increased amount of funding for that program. Um, last December, Congress passed the M Museums and Library Services Act, which reauthorized the library services and technology act funds and that act also called for an increase in the base funding that all state libraries receive from 680,000 to a million dollars um COSLA the chief officers of state library agencies working with ALA council and the ALA legislative committee or committee on legislation agreed to a phased ask to start uh, with reaching that increased base funding and then over a, a period of years try to achieve that dollar per capita. Um, the House approved a budget that would fund that base increase. Uh, so that's very, very good news. The Senate budget um, what's being discussed right now would not fund that base increase what's being discussed out of the the health and labor committee right now is about a two million dollar increase to the library services technology act uh, what came out of the house was about a 17 million dollar increase so they're quite a ways apart um, there will be some budget negotiation between the House and the Senate. We hope that the uh, uh, what is the amount that is uh, uh, agreed upon is greater than the two million, but we suspect it won't be anywhere near the 17 million. So we do hope that there'll be some kind of increase to LSTA this next year in, in the federal FY20 budget, um, but it won't be that full base increase that we were hoping for. And again, this is a kind of a multi-year initiative to try to um, increase the amount of LSTA funds that comes to states in support of library development. So we won't know anything more until the final budget is passed by Congress. Okay, thank you. Anything else for anybody, from anybody? Uh, there was a comment from um, Debbie Kramer in the chat box that uh, if the, um, the reorganization of governance for ALAs is going to be brought up by, to the MLA board, that it will need to be added to the agenda. I think she, that was, direct, was directed at you, Matt. So. Oh, I see. Yeah. So they are meeting. Um, in October after the fall retreat. So I think that would be October 14th. Yeah. Yeah, Debbie, I will make sure that that gets posted or I will, I will make sure it gets on the agenda. Okay, everybody, anything else to bring up before we conclude today? 
And Great. with that, I will go ahead and stop our recording. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you.